Welcome to Champlain Presents, a showcase of documentaries produced by Champlain broadcast media students. I'm Ian Noyes. And I'm Dan Boyd. We're here at the Media Factory, where we sometimes meet to work with staff on producing our documentaries. Then, in class, we meet in teams to come up with ideas, then shoot, write, and edit those stories. That's right. This year, we're featuring two pieces related to life in Vermont. One is about immigration. Four of our classmates wanted to tell stories of people who came to Vermont from countries around the world, and in doing so, have had an impact on our communities, especially in Chittenden County. The four profiles are stories of hardship and hope, stories about people who started businesses in Vermont and are literally bringing something new to the table. But our first piece is about a very different kind of struggle, homelessness. Classmate Jacob Corbley, Dan, and I wanted to tell the story of what it's like to be homeless for thousands of Vermonters, a difficult story. But then Ian made contact with someone who had made our story possible. His name is Nate Farnham. Nate isn't homeless anymore, but he used to be. And his story tells us a lot about what it's like to no longer have a roof over your head. Our piece is called Once Homeless. From the outside looking in, Nate Farnham of Morrisville is living a normal life. He's an emergency medical tech in training and an advocate for disadvantaged youth. But dig deeper into Nate's life story and it becomes clear that his life has been anything but normal. Of his 23 years, Nate spent 15 in the foster care system. And then for two years after that, he was homeless. Just over a year ago, Nate found a place to call home for the first time since his early childhood. So growing up, my mom was was good. She originally was a truck driver, had a class A CDL, has that endorsement, made very, very good money. Of course, things went downhill. She got into a truck driving accident. Come to find out she had completely broken her back. And the doctor was surprised that she was even walking around to begin with. Pain management was Oxycontin and Oxycodone, two of the most addictive painkillers on the market. Things were fine at first, eventually prescribed amount became max. Max prescribed amount didn't do shit, so self-medication it is. Didn't stop my mom from being a good parent. You know, nobody would have known the wiser. I always ate, I always had food in the house, was never, never malnourished, never nothing. One Saturday morning, May 26th, 2006, just any normal Saturday. Wake up in the morning, go out, make my cereal, head out to the living room, just get ready to start watching the SpongeBob marathon with my mom. And hear a knock on the door. And there's a woman in a dark blue blouse, sports jacket, and two state troopers, one on each side of her. I told my mom they were there to take me into DCF social services care. And that started my road to hell. Nate says a neighbor reported his mother's drug use to the Vermont Department of Children and Families, or DCF, and he was placed in the foster care system, which would change his life in ways he never expected. There's a lot of ways people end up here, but first and foremost, folks, um, there's a centralized reporting system, our centralized intake. Ultimately, you know, I think there's this misnomer that child welfare, like we're the baby snatchers. We're the ones who come and take kids away from their parents, but ultimately it's a judge who decides. The foster homes Nate was placed in varied. There were some good moments with Nate being able to play for his high school football team, but there were awful ones as well. Nate says he sustained physical, mental, and emotional abuse, the worst of which happening when he was just 10 years old. I remember one time I got back from uh, mentoring, and I think, it was, I think I had a visit with my mom that day. I'm not 100%. This was back in 2008. I wanted to just kind of go in my room, be by myself, play my video games, just isolate for a little while, try to calm down, try to bring myself back to kind of center ground. They were right in the middle of cooking dinner at the time. And they were like, no, you need to come into the kitchen, sit down and eat. I'm like, I'm not hungry. Like, just put it aside, I'll eat it later. Well, they didn't like that. So 
foster mom came in my room after I went in my room and shut the door. Well, a bunch of words go back and forth. Basically tries to grab me by my arm and start moving me toward the kitchen. And I just, I pull back and I'm like, no, I'm not going out there. Like it's, it's not happening. During when I pulled my arm away from her, I think, uh, Either A, she made it think she thought I hit her, or B, I may have made some slight contact when I was pulling away. Um, but she ended up slapping me right across the face. And kind of just tried to give myself some space by pushing her back. And uh, after that, she basically put me on the ground and hit me and slapped me multiple times in the face. And then uh, ended up grabbing me by my hair and dragging me from my my room out into the kitchen. That shit hurt. Well, shortly after that, they all went into their rooms and I snuck out my window and left. By the time Nate was 18 years old, he was facing a tough reality. At this point, he'd already lived in over 30 foster care placements. Suddenly, he found himself without a home. And then I spent two and a half, three years couch surfing, living in my vehicle, being homeless. I would not sleep very well at all during the winter time because I'd have to wake up. I'd wake up every, you know, two hours or so, freezing fucking cold. I'd have to start my car and let it warm up before I could go back to bed. And by that time, I was pretty much fully awake. So it sucked trying to go to sleep in the winter. About one third of the American homeless population sleeps on the street or in a vehicle. Often people who live in cars get parking violations a number which has doubled in the last 10 years, according to one study. If that's what you have and that's your shelter, um, then that, it, there's no law against it. When law enforcement comes in play or when it becomes a problem is when you're on private property. And in, in reality, especially in Chittenden County, it's hard to find any place to park that's not private property. Because of Nate's good relationship with law enforcement, he wasn't often ticketed. But there were still many day-to-day -day difficulties he faced. And I mean, overall, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily the greatest living off of basically fast food or, you know, simple shit that doesn't go bad in a day that I could eat that same day. While fast food and other cheap options were a part of Nate's diet, he also relied on shelters in the area for food. In Burlington, the Community Resource Center has seen an uptick in use over the last year. I think like ideally there would be one of these. Um for like every mile or like every ward say because when we started out last year this place was getting like 20 visitors per day this year we're getting 80 to 100 visitors per day nate relied on shelters like this once in a while but mostly he slept in his car now he lives on his own with help from vermont's youth development program nate's long-standing connection with ydp led to big changes Lawmakers working on foster care regulations reached out and found Nate Farnham. In 2018, still homeless, Nate stood with Vermont Governor Phil Scott as new safeguards at DCF were signed into law. These days, Nate is active in youth advocacy groups, fighting for improved policies that would help children in the foster care system avoid the worst parts of his experience. But Nate isn't the only one fighting for change. Changes have been made within DCF to help people in the system avoid Nate's path. I've been the district director for five and a half years, and in that time, um, we've implemented transition to age meetings for kids who are getting, once you reach the age of 17, we start to have quarterly meetings with your team and who are your people. We try to expand what we call our circles of support with folks like Nate. There are other changes afoot. In Burlington, the city council unanimously approved a $3 million plan. Roughly a third of that will go towards making the Community Resource Center, previously only operated in the winter, a year-round option for Burlington's homeless population. In the meantime, there are more immediate concerns, as there isn't a plan for a new location after the lease runs out later this year. So we have the budget to operate year-round, but I don't know where we'll be operating after April. So that's definitely hanging in limbo right now and something that we're thinking about and hoping the city will organize in a timely manner. While the state is also pushing for more resources, the general consensus is that not enough help is available. For that matter, Nate is an example of someone who didn't get enough help when he needed it. 
He tells the story of a friend who witnessed the effects of Nate's never-ending battle with his past. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the mental health diagnoses that I have now stem from my time in DCF. There have been times where I'll wake up in the morning and he'll literally look at me and not even ask, but tell me that I had a, a PTSD break in my sleep or a PTSD nightmare in my sleep uh, because he'll just hear me going on and, and shouting no and just basically going back in time in my, in my sleep to my time in DCF and reliving some of those traumas. Just outside of downtown Morrisville, Vermont, there's a small shopping center where for years you would find Nate Farnham sleeping in his car. What you wouldn't see is the path that led him to that place, the separation from his family at a young age, and the system that failed him at every turn. And you wouldn't see the apartment just down the road where Nate lives now. Nate Farnham is an exceptional person who survived and fought until he was able to stand on his own two feet. And now his goal is no longer to help just himself. It's to change the system that failed him and others who may not be able to find their way out. Welcome back. I'm now joined by Ian and Jacob. Um, we're going to take a second to make answer some questions about the production of the documentary. Jacob, we're going to start with you because you have a little bit of a personal connection with Nate. Do you mind taking a second and explaining that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, much like Nate, I was um, in the foster care system as well. Um, although I didn't spend nearly as much time um, in DCF as he did. I spent maybe less than a year. Um, when he started talking about his time in DCF, it kind of really hit home with me and um, made me grateful that I wasn't, I didn't end up in the same situation afterwards that he was. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. Ian, you also have a little bit of connection with Nate, and you're the one that found uh, Nate as a contact for our piece. Can you talk us through how you found him? Yeah, so um, Nate and I, we grew up uh, in a very similar area, so uh, about a town over. So I know a few of the same people he knows, it. I know the same places he know, but in a different context. Um, so once uh, we were doing our project about homelessness, uh, uh, my dad put me in contact with Nate as someone who used to be homeless. And uh, from what, like, once our, we had our first conversation with him, we knew it was really going to change the course of our piece because it, we had such an impactful conversation. Uh, do you want to touch a bit more on uh, how that shifted our process, Dan? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, initially we had started with the goal of making a document about homelessness in Vermont kind of as a general issue. Um, but when we found, like you mentioned, when we found Nate, we kind of knew that this was someone who had a really interesting story, a really compelling story, and someone who was really good on camera too. So we shifted our story to tell kind of mostly just Nate's story. Um, and I think one, one of the big reasons we did that is telling this big picture of homelessness in Vermont is a really challenging thing. So you know, in order to tell that picture, you have to tell the tiny parts first. So we wanted to pick a tiny little sector of what homelessness, homelessness in Vermont is, and that's Nate's story, and that's the story that we told. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you guys so much for watching. Sometimes you hear that Vermont has the least amount of diversity in the country, but that's not quite true. Hi, I'm Isabel Schoenemann. And I'm Mike Safey. According to US News and World Report, Vermont is number two. But more importantly, diversity in the Green Mountain State has actually been changing a lot in the last 10 years. More people of color are deciding to settle in Vermont, and more people from other parts of the world are immigrating here. As students in Burlington, we became increasingly aware that some of the places we'd go to, like to get food or get a haircut, were owned by people that we wanted to know more about. With partners Maya Gassman and Logan Chalmers, we produce four profile pieces of people who set up shop here. Our story is called Business Beyond Borders.
Ahmed Omar is cooking his famous Philly steak sandwich, but this isn't your average cheesesteak. Omar infuses each of his dishes with a unique Somali twist. I want to make sure that, oh, I had a Philly in other places, but when I come to Kismayo, this is the best Philly I've ever had. And you can find these special dishes at his restaurant, Kismayo Kitchen, the only source of Somali cuisine in Vermont. For Omar, it's been a long journey to Kismayo Kitchen. He was born in Kismayo, Somalia, where he and his family were forced to flee due to the Civil War. I left there when I was young, when I was a little kid, because of the Civil War. And, um, you know, uh, we got, um, when the war happened, you know, one of our family get killed and, and uh, we decided, you know, to get out of there. It was bad. People are coming to your house. When the Civil War happened, people are coming to your house because there was no job, there was no income, everybody, and, you know, people are breaking houses, stealing your money, uh, killing you, uh, raping a woman, and it was bad. Omar and his family fled to Kenya as refugees then came to the United States in 2004 when he was 16. Along with some of his family members, Omar was placed in Vermont and graduated from Burlington High School in 2006. When I came here, my first job was McDonald's. I'm like, wow, these people love food. These people enjoying it. And that what makes me come. My mom is a chef. So I got most of the ideas, most of this. So I was like, mom, you gotta show me this. I can cook for you tomorrow. And I start falling in love with it. I feel when I came here, I was like, okay, this city needs me. This city needs my recipe. The secret ingredient is always love. You gotta have that love. Like I, I, like, to come, I like to come to my customer, talk to them, ask how's their day as. I'm not gonna put my sandwich and put it there and get, get my money like I don't know you. No, we don't do that. Like, I cook for you a nice meal. I talk to you, how you feeling? I grab you a glass of water, you tired, you know. Omar says that finding success was no easy feat, but his background prepared him for the hardships of being a business owner. Life is tough, bro. You gotta learn how to survive. You gotta learn how to adapt it. I know my father, if he was here today, I wish he was here, but never happened. But what I'm gonna do, sit down and cry? No, you gotta, man, you gotta find how to hunt. You gotta find a way. There's always exit, but you gotta work hard for it. Nothing comes easy. Uh, when you open a restu restaurant, it's not easy. That's one of the hardest jobs in the world. And when you open the business, you cannot start paying people right away because you, you don't know if you're gonna make money. Very good. Uh, I'm blessed. Uh, I know there's a lot of uh, toughness, but you know, like uh, it was upside and down, but I'm very blessed that I have amazing community get my back. It isn't just his food that brings his customers back. His attitude and dedication to serving a good meal leaves diners feeling like a part of Omar's family. It's not fatty, not greasy. You can eat this and you, in a couple hours later you might need another one. I like to taste it to make it fresh. Before we make the ingredients, we want to make sure that is this amazing? Yes, then I'll put it in the menu. In the quiet town of St. George, Vermont, Miriam counter manages all operations of her home-based business, Matryoshka's Bakery. Miriam's specialty is French macarons, not to be confused with macaroons. The main ingredient in macarons is almond flour, which gives the pastry its fluffy, smooth texture. Pretty much ready, and we have water. We have, we're making Italian meringue. From Russia, Miriam was 21 when she first came to Vermont through an international work program. One reason she came, to brush up on her English. My dad always like kind of pushed me with English, like that I need to learn, you know, better. And I want to kind of improve my language here. It was a great opportunity for us to exercise our language, to work, to make money, and to meet friends, and to learn about the culture too. My goal was to be able, I think I was, when the first year I came, it was like, could I, well, am I gonna be able to think in English, you know, dream in English? And like, after all those years, I think definitely being, me, having friends, you know, and television and husband and all that helped. With all her family back in Russia, Miriam made the tough decision to stay in the States. 
It was my second year and um, I, met, I met my husband. We thought that I must, maybe I, I'll try to, you know, extend my visa and to see if um, I can travel or go to school here. It didn't happen because we got married. So, um, but, you know, um, I'm happy with the decision definitely that I made. Miriam's adjustment was gradual. Living in the States since 2005, she's adapted to American culture, but Miriam seldom gets to visit her family in Russia. She misses certain family traditions, so she keeps some of them alive at home. We have in the back there some of our that are on the table. It's a Russian, like a teapot. And uh, like I've always wanted to have it in our home because it was like something that my grandpa had. Like my grandpa would be always sitting at the like, head of the table and anyone who walked in, he wouldn't let them go because he would start pouring tea for them. So that was his thing. Like, I think that's one of the things I missed. It was no easy feat deciding to start a baking business. Miriam had other things to fall back on, including a degree in early childhood education. But as a mother of three, she wanted flexibility and independence. So she became an entrepreneur and named her business after the dolls Russia's famous for. That's when I decided that it's going to be Matryoshka's Bakery. Like, it didn't take too long to decide the name because I'm a mother with three kids and it represents my country and I loved Matryoshka's. With macarons, it's my creation. You know, I just, we just think of something, like, we'll think of, oh, I have an idea, and we just go with the idea, you know, where I don't have to, like, follow precise um, orders. Over time, she expanded, catering macarons for other businesses in the area, including Brio Coffee Works, Lunig's Bistro, and Shelburne Vineyard. Customers can buy her macarons at places like Good Times Cafe or on her website. Mariam has more plans for the future and hopes to open a new space with a bigger kitchen. But for now, she's continuing her experiments with new macaron flavors and is working on combining the qualities of Vermont into her delicacies. Мне очень нравится готовить макароны. Это это мой маленький бизнес, и я очень горжусь. On a busy street in Winooski lies Golden Scissors, a hair salon owned and fully operated by Melissa Din. Nice to meet you again. I've been Welcome to Golden Scissors. Have a seat in my chair. So, haircut? Yep. Here, Melissa is giving a classic clipper cut to a regular customer. Originally from Vietnam, Melissa went through years of hardship before coming to the U.S. She was born during a time of political conflict and faced a heavy amount of racism. Because when I grow up in Vietnam, in my generation, um, it, it was, you know, after the war, so the country was messed up. My, my dad is full African-American, my mom Vietnamese. So um, we got two, two big issues at that time in Vietnam. First, we from South, and the North win the battle at the Civil War. Second is my dad is African American. Any American doesn't have to be African American. White or black is the same. Long that you are American baby, you get harassed. Melissa says at the time, Vietnam was not welcoming to biracial citizens and ultimately her family decided it was time to go. After leaving Vietnam, Melissa and her family were sent to a refugee camp in the Philippines for six months. There, they were subjected to labor-intensive jobs such as cleaning the streets. And grow up in the small town and um, so, you know, low educated, so I don't know much about the world. I don't know what American is. I don't know any country besides, you know, the town that I grew up. But she would move to another town, Winooski, Vermont. With help from a refugee organization, Melissa and her family arrived in 1992. She was just 19. Although grateful to be in a new country, Vermont was not her first choice. From day one, I never bet, I, I never wanted to be in Vermont uh, because of the cold and the darkness in the winter time. You know, where I grow up, it's sun all year long, you know, sun and hot. Oh, 
Once settled, to keep receiving aid from the refugee program, Melissa had to find a job within six weeks. Not only did she do that, she also graduated high school and got her cosmetology license. While I'm in the school, the Axis Tech um, come up and introduce their program. And I'm like, oh, that's what I want. You know, I want to be hairdresser. All right, how old is she now? 13, she just turned 13. Oh, 13, huh? Melissa's training was going well, but her health was going in the opposite direction. The last 10 years, I come down with leukemia, stage 4 leukemia, so I don't think I can make it. So I pray, I believe in God, and I pray. And if His will let me live, um, and if God loves me and let me survive, um, because at that time, my daughter only three years old too. Uh, I don't want my daughter to grow up without a mom and get harassed in a bill like I've been through. Uh, if he let me survive, I want um, to have my own business. And Melissa achieved just that. She opened Golden Scissors in 2017 and has thoroughly enjoyed being her own boss. I work very hard. I try my best. And I work hard so I get a lot of trophy. And uh, one of my trophy is uh, Golden Scissor. So I like, oh, I like that name. So I like, okay. So I named Golden Scissor. Her transition to America wasn't easy, but Melissa persevered and made a life in Vermont. She's excited at the prospect of expanding her space. I cannot predict the future. I cannot. I don't know what's going on tomorrow. Just enjoy it, this moment right now. <laughs>On the corner of East Allen Street and Abenaki Way in Winooski sits Morning Light Bakery. Egg tarts, taro bubble tea, and strawberry mochi are just some of the items you'll find on their menu. Inside the bakery, Ken Liu and his family are working hard, mixing drinks and baking their signature pastries. My name is Ken, and I am currently working um, at my parents' bakery just to help my parents out to make sure their business is successful. Originally from Hong Kong, Ken and his family moved to the U.S. when he was just 13. The biggest reason for the uh, immigration to the United States was that my parents believed a lot more opportunities uh, for our family uh, here in the United States. There are definitely a lot of opportunities, I would say. One thing I like the most about Vermont is that um, I would say people are more connected to each other than it is out of state uh, in, uh, in the big cities area. Thank you very much. Yeah. Customer interaction is definitely uh, one of my most interested uh, thing uh, in, in my job at the bakery. I don't re really consider my work at a bakery. It's more something that I enjoy a lot. The biggest transition uh, from Hong Kong to Vermont uh, would be the language because my home language uh, I speak in Cantonese. I was not sure that immigration really means like changing your entire life um, by moving to somewhere else that is totally different than where you were born. In 2019, Ken's family opened Morning Light. Although they didn't have experience running a bakery, they were inspired to open one like the ones they loved in Hong Kong. Before they know that they're immigrating here to uh, the United States, my parents took some classes in, um, in baking and uh, they learned how to bake um, Asian style uh, cakes, um, which are usually less sweeter side. They're more uh, usually made with whipped cream rather than um, like um, heavy uh, butter creams. Our type of baking uh, is not as common in here in the area. So we wanna bring in uh, something different and something more diverse here. My parents weren't 100% English speaker. They did not have a lot of English uh, background when they were in Hong Kong. And they came here having to learn some conversational English. I would usually be the person that uh, deals with the communication. And this is in order to make sure uh, customers are understanding things well. When he's not working at the bakery, Ken is finishing college as a computer science major at the University of Vermont. 
so far I do not have any um, plans on what's after college. I would say that I am very uh, interested into working locally. It can be working with my parents at the bakery, uh, which I am totally fine with and I enjoy working here uh, because I can uh, I get more chances to, to know more people and uh, to see customers uh, day to day. Despite a hectic balance between work, school, and personal time, Ken maintains a positive outlook. I'm pretty proud of myself uh, and my parents as well. I know my parents are, uh, they are a pair of really hard workers. I would say they are, they made a hundred points um, on being good parents. And he's glad they brought him to Vermont, but his path forward is uncertain. He does not know if he will continue to work with his family and help be their interpreter, or if he will use his college education to plot out another direction. A regular coconut bubble tea and a curry chicken bun and yeah. a vegetable steam bun. So it will be 1048 today. Thank you very much. Vermont is not like that. It's like people were like, hey, how, even if they don't know you, hey, how you doing, you know? It's like people respect each other. And my goal is to open a couple restaurants in everywhere. My dream is I have a big dream, I have a vision, and I'm sure I believe my, I'm confident, I believe my dreams, and the dreams always come true. My dream is to be able to go to a bigger production where I have a bigger team and we can, you know, where we can, we'll be able to ship maybe, you know. My dream is to get bigger, to let other uh, states to know about Matryoshka's Bakery and the macarons. For the last 10 years, um, the leukemia kind of changed my uh, respective. Um, the weather, the people, it doesn't bother me anymore. Um, long that I live, long that I get up and not in the hospital bed, I'm happy. I enjoy uh, doing what I'm doing at the bakery, like getting to know customers and uh, they usually show support and that's something that I'm, I, would probably not see if they're only treating us as um, that like customer business relationship. We're joined now by Logan and Maya to talk through the process of our documentary and why we chose the people we chose. Yeah, Logan and Maya, what are your thoughts on why we decided to really make a documentary on this topic? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Well, we had a bunch of different topics that we were thinking through, and immigration was one that we were interested in because we found out there's just a lot of immigrant-owned businesses in Burlington, and they all have different stories to tell, and they have all different products to share. So yeah, that's kind of why we, we picked that. And to that point, we really wanted to do our part to explore the missions behind these owners and the cultures behind the businesses they created. Now, to that point, can you two talk a little bit about the four businesses we specifically chose? Yeah, well, I think, you know, we really encountered all these businesses in our day-to-day -day lives as college students. You know, we met all of these business owners before we even had the idea of making this documentary, and I think they had a lot to share, so that's why I wanted to cover it at least. Yeah, it was actually a conversation with Melissa while I was getting my hair cut one day that sparked the idea for the whole documentary. Is as I was talking, I was like, wow, this woman has a really interesting story, and I'd be interested to know what other people I've met through my time here have an equally interesting story to dig into. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Logan, I actually have a question for you. You've been here your whole life in Vermont. Why do you think this story is important for viewers? Well, for people like me, myself, I've been here 21 years, three out of our four businesses I hadn't really gotten to explore or even known before coming to Champlain College. So this documentary really gave me a chance to explore a little bit more of Vermont and see some of these businesses. And for the average Vermonter, you may go to Kismayo once a month, two times a week, but it's really the story behind Omar that makes Kismayo special. And the average Vermonter doesn't get a chance to see that or the Lou family or any of the other people we covered. And I think that was really cool for the average Vermonter to get to hear their stories and why the business is open. Yeah, and as someone who came from outside Vermont, I think it was equally interesting to kind of dive into why these people came to Vermont specifically, whether they came here voluntarily or they were placed here. Vermont's not typically a place that you think of as a hub for immigration. You tend to think of big cities. So seeing why these people gravitated to this region of the country was really interesting for us as well. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you all for watching. We'll be back soon for a goodbye. Thank you 
you for watching Champlain Presents and also thank you for watching our documentaries. I'd like to give out a couple thanks. First, we have Jess Wilson, who's the co-director of The Media Factory. <laughs> And also a thank you to her beautiful dog, Willow, who is <laughs> covered the in the tablecloth. Um, I'd also like to give out a thanks to our professor, Keith Oppenheim. Um, so yeah, thank you for watching our documentaries. Everyone ready? Yep. yep. Okay, bye. bye.